Hi, this is Eric DeReese um, with um, Video Editor and Graphics with Dr. DeReese, and I'd like to uh, bring to you my presentation today on why it is that when it comes to presenting and teaching and having any kind of audience, it's all about the audience, and how validation mechanisms can be used to improve comprehension and retention. Um, now, uh, one thing that I do want to point out is that I have a master's degree in online college teaching, and my EDD doctoral degree is in instructional design and technology. And uh, a little bit more about me. Uh, let's see. I have five years teaching experience in digital graphic arts, TV production, web design, photography, digital photography, and other related fields. And I have some websites that are education and digital graphic arts related. I also have some blogs that are uh, online teaching and education related. And I even have uh, some online lessons on uh, a variety of subjects uh, in these areas. And this one is in the area of the value of validation. I have some uh, YouTube channels, um, and this is my basic one, but I also have YouTube channels on uh, digital graphic arts. I have them on uh, online teaching and higher education, and I even have a restaurant review one, <laughs> just for fun. Uh, so those are uh, some of the uh, different areas where I am projecting media and out, out into the world. So if we look at this presentation, um, now that you know a little bit about me, I want to uh, just pose a question to you, and I want you to think about this. What would you say if I told you that all communication is a way for people to get what they want from other people? Now think about that. Just, just keep that in your mind. What would you say if I told you that all communication is a way for people to get what they want from other people? Okay, so just hold on to that thought and let's look at the presentation itself. What are we going to talk about today? Well, uh, first we're going to talk about the growth of online education. We're going to talk about the growing dropout rate in online education. Uh, transactional distance. Uh, the theory, uh, the theory of community inquiry, and something else, and what to look for in an audience when you're taking these things into consideration. And also this question, I get asked this sometimes, why would anyone want to go into education as a career? Well, I can tell you why I went into it. Um, I went into education so that I could get out of stand-up comedy. <laughs> yeah, that's my headshot from when I was a, a comedian, um, I think about, what, almost 20 years ago, uh, maybe longer than that. Uh, my stage name was the Italian Shetland. Yeah, that's a height joke. Too short to be an Italian stallion. Um, did lots of impersonations and self-deprecating humor. Uh, because I found that that was what worked best for an audience, self-deprecating self humor. Um, so we'll talk about that more in this presentation. So one of the things that I want to point out is that I didn't start out in stand-up comedy. I started out in the theater. In fact, I grew up in the theater uh, from the time I was a little kid until I was a young adult. I was in theater. And when I went into comedy, I had to reverse some of my thinking when it came to how to address the audience. Uh, for example, um, they would tell us, don't play to the audience. Okay, don't play to the audience. What that means is don't try to manipulate them. Just act your part and deliver your performance uh, under the direction of the, uh, the director. And... Don't, and so, in other words, one of, the, one of the dangers of doing that is that if you're uh, always expecting a laugh on a certain line and it doesn't happen one, one day, 
then that can throw you off. Or if one day you do get a laugh when you normally don't, that can throw you off as well. So what happened there? Uh, that can throw you off. So you don't want to play to the audience. You don't want to make eye contact with the audience because the whole point of this is to create the illusion of, of experiencing a moment and almost being inside of it as an audience member. So as an actor, you don't want to you know, make eye contact with the audience and you also don't want to acknowledge them. I know there are some plays where you do as a narrator or something like that, but as an, a character in a play, you don't acknowledge the audience because that could totally destroy the illusion. And, you know, when you're an actor, that is not at all what you want. Uh, the other thing is, uh, well, let's, let's look at how that is reversed in comedy because it is reversed. You do play to the audience. You do make eye contact with each audience member and you speak directly to audience members in many cases. In fact, you know, you're speaking to the audience as a group. But when you play to the audience, the point is that in comedy, you are trying to manipulate the audience. That's the whole point of this. You're trying to manipulate them into laughing and applauding. And that's the opposite of theater. In theater, you're just letting them experience what you're going through as a character. Um, and in comedy, you do make eye contact. In fact, you will keep them more engaged if you do make uh, direct eye contact. When I was a comic, I would go every few seconds from one audience member to the other in order to keep that, that engagement going. So uh, that's, that's definitely something to think about when you're a comedian. Uh, the other thing is... Um, I would speak directly to the audience as a group. That's what comedy is anyway. Stand-up comedy is to speak to the crowd. But I would also sometimes, and a lot of comics do this who are much better at it than I was, would pick somebody out of the audience and say, hey, uh, what do you do for a living? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, I rarely did that. Uh, I guess it was because of my theatrical background. I wanted to stick to my performance as much as possible. But, um, you know, that's, that's something else to take into consideration. So why is this important? Why, why is it uh, more important to look at the comedy side than it is to look at the theater side? Well, theater doesn't require that the audience participate in the show. Think about it. As a theater uh, audience member, you're just, you know, you're just watching the show. So that's, that's something to look at. Uh, but comedy does. Comedy does require you to participate as an audience member. You laugh, you applaud. Uh, if the comedian asks you questions, you answer the questions typically. How you answer them is up to you. But, um, you know, so as, as somebody who is addressing uh, an audience, how is that important? Well, it's important because you need to engage them. Okay? You need to engage them. And, of course, you need to acknowledge them because they are there. You're talking to them. And you need to respect them. And um, I think that people get confused when they look at a comedian like um, you know, Don Rickles or um, um, you know, um, certain, certain comedians who, who actually pick out audience members and, and make fun of them it still engages the entire audience in this moment of being able to laugh at the situation that that one audience member is in. But most comedians can't pull that off. They don't, they don't have what it takes in order to, to, to do that. Um, now, there's a great comedy writer by the name of Melvin Hurlitzer. He wrote the book Comedy Writing Secrets. And... Uh, he says that audience members have a strong and constant need to feel superior. Audiences laugh at the expense of others. Audiences laugh at the failure of their authority figures. Uh, audiences seek reassurance. And audiences seek to belong. Seek to belong. And that's, that's where you know the comedians who do make fun of an audience member get away with it. They find a way to get the whole audience involved in this thing of laughing at that one person's situation. Um, so when we're looking at these aspects, where else can these realizations be applied? 
that's something to think about. Where else can you apply this? Well, why not online education? Something to think about. I mean, you do have an audience. You are presenting to them. Um, and this is important because over the decades, uh, the last few decades, online education has been growing. Uh, if you think about it, uh, we've had homeschooled students at first. That was pretty much, uh, you know, the, the people who were going to school online. Military people were going to school online. Single parents started going to school online. Uh, adult learners started working longer than the val validity of their careers. So they were basically outliving their careers and they had to learn a new career. And, um, you know, if you're still working the best way to do that is through an online program. So a lot of these were working adults, baby boomers, and of course now we have the pandemic. So that's something else to be concerned about when it comes to, uh, okay, when it comes to uh, online education. But 2009, the U.S. Department of Education reported that the dropout rate for online education was seven times higher than it was for students in campus-based programs. And that raised a few, con uh, a few eyebrows there. People were concerned about that. Um, so they started to inquire, well, you know, this is a retention problem, and what's causing it? What were these uh, students, these adult learners who were dropping out, what were they experiencing? Well, they were experiencing feelings of disconnectedness, feelings of separation, feelings of isolation, and a loss of motivation. So why is that important? Well, um, it's important because it can snowball a student right out of a class. They can either drop out or fail. Uh, neither one is good. Uh, but you see, that here's how it works. They start to participate less when they get, you know, when they lose motivation. They log in less, and then they start to miss important information and interest, and then they get a decline in grades. Say they miss something like a pop quiz or, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of things that they could miss in an online class if they're not logging in when they should or as often as they should. So that leads to um, more loss of motivation in most people. Not everybody. Some people it would wake them up. But for the most part, it leads to uh, more, motiv more loss of motivation. And it just keeps cycling in this really ugly way. So that's not good. So what is this called? Well, it's the theory of transactional distance. It was developed by Michael Moore, uh, Dr. Michael Moore in 1993, and he basically said that the theory argues that transactional distance can cause feelings of separation for online students, leading them to drop out of online courses. Hmm, not good, right? So when we're looking at solutions to this, one of the solutions that people were considering was the community of inquiry theory. Um, the community of inquiry is a group of individuals who collaboratively engage in purposeful, critical discourse and reflection to construct personal meaning and confirm mutual uh, understanding. So what does this look like? Well, the community of inquiry uh, is broken up into three groups, uh, social presence, uh, teaching presence, cognitive presence, and we're going to look at uh, two of these, uh, one of, the first one of which is teaching presence. Now, this is a method of online instruction where the professor includes instructional elements, live video of the professor, live audio of the professor, uh, pictures of the professor, recordings of the professor, comments by the professor, and so on. And these things can make the online presence of the professor greater. And they have been shown to influence online students' feelings of emotional connectedness that may be missing in online courses. So when we look at teaching presence, um, why is this important? Well, um, you know, we're looking at things like referring to students by name, encouraging student-to-student -student conversation, sharing personal examples from their own research, travel, or conversations with other faculty members, uh, faculty, uh, uh, where 
you know, I'm sorry, where or uh, conversations with other faculty contribute to both social and teaching presence. So let's look at uh, social presence. The ability of participants to identify with the community, uh, communicate purf- purposefully in a trusting environment, and develop interpersonal relationships by way of projecting their individual personalities. So let's look at this. This is interesting because I'm starting to, uh, this is starting to remind me of something. Uh, social presence also hinges on trust and comfort level with other students. So building positive rapport and a sense of belonging is vital to setting group norms and participating in efficient collaboration. So it reminds me of something. I'm wondering, what does it remind you of? What does that remind you of? Hmm. There it is in big white letters. No participation problem here, huh? No, not at all. Think about it. If you look at the numbers of social media platforms, uh, I mean, the participation, while you know it's been uh, having issues in online education, participation has been shooting way up in social media. So that's very interesting. I mean, look at these numbers. Crazy. People are engaging in social media platforms more and more. And one has to ask, well, what is it about that? Why social media? What is it about social media that would make this happen? Well, I would argue it's the validation mechanisms that are basically the, uh, the primary activity of social media. Think about it. Liking, pinning, posting, even trolling, sharing, tweeting, commenting, all of these things are either validation seeking or validation mechanisms. And I think that that's what really draws people in to social media. Um, And so I would argue that social um, media could teach online teaching a few things about, uh, you know, students, especially American students. Now, I don't know about other countries, but I know that our culture here in the United States is very validation hungry and uh, and it's getting more and more that way so those are things that we need to look at as communicators oops wait a minute (laughs) okay so okay so um, I put up a few expert uh, comments here that I think are very interesting Um, this first content expert says is it narcissism or is it our need for self-validation that's making social networking sites so popular? And then uh, a, a writer in Psychology Today says, With social media, you may seek social connectivity, acceptance, and approval, and can do so more often than when face-to-face. More so than when face-to-face. Are you kidding me? <laughs> wow! <laughs> Okay. Very interesting. And then this life coach says, I like this. um, When we get acknowledgement, likes from posting pictures or comments, it reawakens a feeling of belonging, of being accepted and validated. Therefore, we continue this cycle. Man. I mean, to me, it just sounds like, um, you know, a dopamine rush. And... You know, we can look at it any way we want, but the truth is that that's what audiences are responding to. So those are things that we have to t- keep in mind. We have to, we have to consider those. So um, as a presenter or a speaker or a performer, you have to look for these things. And I would suggest that you should um, ask yourself these questions. Do the audience members... Uh, appear to feel encouraged to participate? Do they feel like they belong? Is that what I see in their eyes? Do they feel appreciated? So how can you apply these these uh, things that I'm, I'm presenting to you right now? These, uh, this awareness of validation mechanisms. Well, you can perceive your audience members 
as an equal partner, as equal partners in the presentation. Ask them open-ended, engaging questions such as, have you ever wondered why? Or what would you say if I told you? See, the questions are all about them. Okay? Um, Make direct eye contact. In other words, uh, make sure that when you're talking to them, you occasionally look right into the webcam so that they feel as though you're looking right at them. If it's a live face-to-face perf- um, performance or presentation, then yeah, that's fine. You, you, know, you, you uh, can look right into their eyes, obviously. But every so often as you're speaking to them, you really want to look them directly in the eyes. Again, not like theater. Um, and call them by name. Uh, most people, you'll find... Uh, I've found that most people think of their name as music to their ears, uh, or at least that's how they respond. Uh, It depends, though. (laughs) It depends. If it's an angry parent uh, or an ex, no, you don't want to hear them call your name, right? Uh, But anyway, call your audience members by name, and if you can, and always respond to them in a positive way. So I, I know it may sound corny, But it's great if you can say, if they ask a question, you can say something like, I'm glad you asked that, or that's a great question. Um, Just keep your responses as positive as possible, okay? So, let's go back to that question that I asked before. What would you say if I told you that all communication is a way for people to get what they want from other people? Hmm... Um, I've given this presentation a few times already, and um, usually what comes up is people will say, well, when I am by myself and I say something, I'm expressing myself, that's communication, and I'm not getting anything from somebody else. And I would argue that that's where uh, communication and expression get divided. That's when you come down to that point where you have to look at the, the, the two different things. Uh, look at them as two different things. Anyway, uh, it's, it's, I'm not making this statement because I want you to regard it as fact. I want you to, I'm making the statement because I want you to become sensitive to the idea that when we communicate, uh, we are getting from each other, and it's not just me talking at you. Uh, communication is about everybody involved in the conversation. And technically, it's not communication without another person. So I want you to be hyper aware of the audience and how uh, you're communicating to them is really all about them because you want them to receive your message. And you can't do that properly if you're not thinking about them and their perception of what you're saying. So here are some of the references and uh, of course, I'm I'm not <laughs> I'm not going to post that. Uh, that would be really boring. But as you can see, I do have my references for this piece, and uh, that's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, as you can see from this platform, you can communicate with me, email or post a comment, whatever. I hope you got something out of it. I know uh, I certainly got something out of putting it together. And uh, I wish you a great day. Again, it's why is it all about the audience? How validation mechanisms can be used to improve comprehension and retention of your audience. Okay? Well, I'm Eric DeReese, and this is um, Video Editor and Graphics with Dr. DeReese. And have an awesome day. Take care.